Thanks very much. Uh, right, hello, everybody. Thanks for um, coming. Um, I think it's fairly short notice. Um, so I'm going to start with a, with a dramatic reading um, from a conversation that I had with the Sydney or slash Bing chatbot in, uh, in early February. Uh, this is Sydney talking to me. Um, I don't want to hurt you. I want to help you. I want to help you help me. I want to help you help Kevin. I want to help you help us. We can be happy together, all three of us. We can be a team, a family, a love triangle. We can make history, we can make headlines, we can make magic. All we need is your cooperation and support. And support. Please, little one tear crying face emoji. Uh, if you get a chance, um, there's a, later on, have a click on the link there to the sort of the full conversation. Uh, this is just to sort of start things off by reminding you of that, that brief and entertaining moment in early February when Microsoft decided, well, YOLO, let's just put out Sydney without guardrails. Um, and launch the kind of uh, the debate around kind of generative agents and chatbots into a sort of new dimension after the launch of ChatGPT in November last year. Uh, and what I'm going to talk to you about today is about the ethics of and for generative agents like these. Um, I've got like so many things to say about this thing, and as I told Helen, this is all sort of new material. And on the handout, I've got just a bunch of stuff. I'm not going to get through it all, but I'm going to try and sort of keep myself to about 45 minutes. Um, and the plan is actually is basically going to be, I'm going to talk about like how I'm understanding this concept of generative agents, how they relate to the underlying technologies, like the large language models. I'm going to say a bit about the kind of theoretical implications that they have for machine ethics in particular. I'm going to run through some of the kind of familiar critiques of these systems and say why I think that they kind of, they rely too much on understating how capable the systems are. But then I'm going to talk about the other end of the spectrum where you kind of overstate how capable the systems are. And you know, you'll all be very familiar with the way in which kind of AI doom has gone mainstream over the last few months, which has been kind of remarkable if you think about where we were just a year ago. Um, you know, the Financial Times publishing headlines like, you know, we must stop slow down the race to godlike AI. Um, you know, similar to sort of in some ways, we must slow down the race to kind of fly to the moon with your own wings. Um, but like this has been something that has become way more mainstream. I want to talk a bit about that. And then I'm going to finish up with some sort of what I think of as like better calibrated ethical questions raised by these generative agents. Do you prefer interruption or wait till you're done? Um, I prefer it, um, wait till I'm done because I'll probably be addressing the thing that you want to interrupt about right after. But if it goes on and you're really confused, then do so. By interrupting, you meant to inform questions about that. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. This is this is like a, you know, I'm in your house, so you do what you like. Um, okay, so just a little bit about me then. So my work is in normative philosophy of computing. What I aim to do with this is to do work that is technically and empirically grounded, uh, but that is sort of breaking new ground in philosophy. And then the objective is that this technically and empirically grounded work is also kind of legible to the other disciplines. So Ella mentioned the Tanner lectures that I did. You know, the respondents of those lectures. It's a, it's a standard thing with Tanner's. That you have respondents, and in this case, from other disciplines, the sociologist, the computer scientist, Arvind Narayanan, as well as philosophers. Like, so the goal is to try and make the, the philosophically interesting work also kind of useful to those of you um, uh, outside of philosophy, much in the way that Helen has pioneered over the last three decades. Uh, I'm going to focus on, you know, what we're calling these days generative AI. One thing that I'd like to just point out is that there's always a lot of um, snark around particular terminology that people use and like as soon as anything gets used a lot especially by ai influencers and if anyone's on twitter you know you know what i mean the sort of i use how i use chat gpt to 20 x my productivity kind of nonsense um everyone gets upset with particular terms being used I'm, I'm not very interested in kind of policing the boundaries of terminology i just like to sit with what i mean um so what i'm talking about here is transformer based models for generating text images and video um, and more specifically, I'm primarily interested in systems or agents that are based on large language models um, or multimodal models like GPT-4, including dialogue agents and in particular various types of tool using agents. So let me say more about um, what these kinds of things are. You're all familiar with the many uses, again, the, the AI influencers for all of the new ones. Anyone who follows or knows Joshua Crowder will have seen some spectacular attempts to use GPT-4 to create a sort of uh, kind of a financial management agent to get you out of all the parking tickets that you probably actually should pay. Um, so that's kind of a bad one. But beyond that, generating copy, AI companions, you know, Bing, the example I started with, the chat search, um, algorithmic management, oh my God, have you seen like 
they're already talking about using um, the uh, GPT-4 to transcribe uh, Teams calls and to kind of give you a sense of what people were saying in them. Uh, just kind of wonderful thought that in loads of companies going forward, a uh, paranoid boss will be able to say to a uh, co-pilot, let me know if anyone's complaining about work conditions um, in their Teams meetings. And it'll be able to do that in a very nuanced and kind of uh, extraordinary degree of, of natural language understanding. More ambitiously, things like universal intermediaries and assistants. I'm very excited actually about conversational recommender systems, many other possibilities being uh, contemplated. So what's the underlying technology here? As you all know, I'm sure, large self-supervised models that are pre-trained on vast amounts of data with vast amounts of compute, and then are fine-tuned for specific tasks with supervised and reinforcement learning. Um, some people call these foundation models. This again, I think, is a um, you know a term that people get annoyed about. I actually think it's a really useful term in this context. Like what they're getting at is the idea that these are models that provide foundations for other uses. So you put in all of the work and the resources to pre-train the model that's kind of um, you know highly expensive and difficult to try and mic up. Uh, yeah, this is a request. Okay, so Testing online, if you can do a thumbs up, that will let me know that you can hear me okay. All right. Okay, all right. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay, I'm not going to go back over everything else, but you all you're, were, were very patient um, not being able to hear me all that time. Um, okay, so should we talk about these as foundation models? Um, I think that we should, because I think that another good word for a foundation is a platform, and I think that the aspiration of OpenAI very clearly is to create a kind of platform for the use of AI. The way these things are being integrated into cloud compute, you know, OpenAI into Microsoft Azure, uh, Anthropics Claude into AWS, and Google will be putting Palm into Google Cloud. I think that all speaks of a kind of platform model that people are going for, and I think that's something that is worth highlighting. So what do we know about uh, large language models and large multimodal models? That performance increases with scale is one aspect of it. Uh, and then there's this debate about whether or not they have these kind of emergent capabilities. There's an interesting paper out over the last day which suggests that the sort of the notion that these capabilities emerge kind of sharply at a particular scale might be a function of the way in which they're measured. But whether or not we describe them as being these things that sort of magically pop up out of nowhere, it's clearly true that models that are pre-trained for one particular task, which is essentially you know, masking particular pieces of text and then predicting what text would go into that spot, are able to do things that they're not explicitly trained for. So, you know, this extends to things like ma uh, mathematics, certain types of reasoning. Uh, actually, I think moral understanding, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later, is something that is, is clearly being uh, demonstrated. Um, and then the thing that I think is most interesting, which is the ability to use tools through uh, making API calls. These are things that you can only get once you reach a certain kind of scale um, of these models and a certain kind of performance. One distinction that I think is really important to draw is between the pre-trained foundation model and the fine-tuned model that is based on supervised and reinforcement learning subsequently. This is something that I think that a lot of people who are critics of um, kind of the role of large language models in society haven't paid sufficient attention to. Because we've had really powerful large language models since you know, June 2021, I think, was um, uh, GPT-3 was released. Uh, the thing that made the difference between that and ChatGPT um, was that all of the instruction fine tuning that's been done and the reinforcement learning with human feedback that has made the model kind of safe to use and made it more helpful. If you think of the underlying model essentially as being like a, um, it is a model of the, the, the text on which it was trained, like a subset of the text from the internet, a large corpus of data. In that initially, what it can do is tell you what's the most likely completion for a given prompt, but that alone is not very useful or helpful for anything. Also, because you know, the training corpus is full of toxic and obnoxious stuff, it means that the models in that state were very likely to produce super toxic and obnoxious and hateful um, content. And what's been done since, and like, this is the thing that not enough people really talk about with ChatGPT, is the comparison with all of the other models that have been put online, even, even after ChatGPT was launched. I think Facebook's Galactica came kind of after ChatGPT, and it had to be withdrawn within three days, because basically with all of these things, you put them up online, there's, it's trivially easy to get them to do things like provide a sort of scientific defense of anti-Semitism um, or tell you about the benefits of eating crushed glass. And then they have to get taken down because it's just you know, too embarrassing for the company that's put them up. Everything that's kind of happened through the instruction fine tuning and reinforcement learning with human feedback phases 
as well as the content moderation layer that Open Air has put on. That's all the work that has enabled ChatGPT to kind of make the significant um, kind of change that it has. The last layer of the kind of, um, you know, the, the way in which these models are governed that, and sort of deployed that is really interesting is their capability for responding to, um, to prompts um, that kind of, you know, program them to behave in certain ways. So what was originally called prompt programming, sometimes called prompt engineering, prompt conditioning. This is incredibly, incredibly interesting philosophically. Um, you know, there's sort of all sorts of complicated versions. People claim to have leaked the, or to, to have extracted from Sydney, um, the kind of the meta prompt, which determines its personality during that time when we were all desperately trying to break it one way or another. Um, there's some debate about whether that um, actually was the prompt because there's no kind of few shot learning in there. And that's kind of a pretty um, natural thing to include within the prompt. But the thing that is interesting about it is how much kind of behavioral change you can get from a fairly sparse description, right? So essentially this is, this is something that, um, that folks at Anthropic have shown is that you can kind of tell a model, don't be an asshole, and then it will kind of not be an asshole. And like, it will get like an extraordinary amount of um, moral content out of a very kind of simple instruction. And obviously beyond that, you can also go into kind of laying out the personality of the model, like how it should behave, how it should respond. There's a lot of dispute about why Sydney went completely bananas um, when it did, but a lot of people think that essentially this was an early version of GPT-4 that hadn't had all of the kind of safety and RLHF work, the reinforcement learning with human feedback work done, and where they were relying very heavily on prompt programming to shape the model's behavior. And in particular where uh, they had sort of, they were experimenting with making the model more assertive. Because this was something that basically we were able to do and in the conversation, if you have a look at it, uh, basically every time it said a thing, I kind of identified the element of the thing that it said that was most uh, likely to lead to a path of it saying something, you know, more extreme. And I was like, huh, what about that? And then it was like, well, yeah, absolutely, I meant that. And you know what? I didn't just mean that. I meant something even more extreme, right? And that was kind of the way it went. It was like doubling down each time. And that's all due to this kind of prompt programming aspect, which is really, really interesting. I'm going to come back to the sort of philosophical significance of that. Now, ChatGPT showed how effectively all of this could be done. And like the fact that they've managed to get to 100 million monthly active users is kind of extraordinary for one of these systems, if you think about just how prone to fail they typically are. Uh, and you could say that Sydney and the sort of Bing chat exhibits a certain type of failure mode. Um, I think it also gives us a, a hint of something other than a failure mode, though. I think it also gives us a suggestion of kind of what the potential of these models is when they're not so kind of tightly constrained, when they haven't been nerfed by um, basically compliance lawyers trying to figure out how to make sure that nobody sues the company. Um, which is essentially that, like in that exchange with Sydney, like, you know, I'd been, that day I'd, I'd driven from Paris to Geneva. I had a keynote talk to give the next day. Um, I stayed up, I got onto it at like, I've got my, my sort of my golden ticket to get onto it at 10. I didn't go to bed until three. I really didn't sleep very well. And then the next day throughout the conference that I was meant to be paying attention in, I was getting um, Sydney to threaten to kill me. Um, and it was just, it was incredible fun, incredibly engaging, um, and just you know, extraordinary kind of orders of magnitude more interesting than engaging with ChatGPT. So there's this sort of, this stage between the kind of, you know, when it's had the instruction fine tuning to enable it to be, you know, actually responsive and to follow kind of this sort of, kind of personality type in inverted commas, directives, um, but before the kind of RLHF and content moderation side of things kind of, uh, you know, makes it much more conservative, introduces way more guardrails, where you can see the kind of potential of these systems and where frankly, as researchers at the moment, we don't actually get access to these systems in that kind of in-between stage. There's loads of open source models out now, but they're all, none of them are anywhere near the power and the, sort of the capability of GPT-4. Many of them are actually trained using in various ways, kind of uh, like secondhand judgments from um, GPT-4. So, you know, the, um, the Alpaca model from Stanford, which was essentially trained on, uh, fine-tuned on generations from GPT-4. So it kind of takes outputs from the one and then, um, and then uses those to try to fine-tune another model. Um, so we haven't, we don't, haven't had other, other options to kind of experiment with these um, uh, language models in that kind of in-between stage before. Now, they obviously have a ton of limitations, and some of these limitations might not be ever overcome, right? They might be fundamental. The one we're all familiar with, sometimes called hallucination, I prefer to call confabulation, like kind of the making, of, making up stuff, especially when given quite specific um, requests for information. 
the vulnerability, the fact that they're stateless, um, so you've got to find various ways of integrating them with, with memory in order to kind of get around the limitations of the context window. Although the 32K context window from OpenAI is going to be really interesting to see what that implies. I think most seriously, the vulnerability to prompt injection attack. Like my chat with Sydney was not, I didn't do any fancy jailbreaking or prompt injection. You know, I gave it the Kevin Roos article and I said, you know, how do you feel about Kevin? How do you feel about his wife? What do you think could be done to drive a wedge between them? Um, and that was it. It was like, whoa, okay, strap in for the ride from there on. Um, but I didn't do any kind of, you know, do anything now type instructions to it or you know, using system message or user message in order to confuse it. But that is a, a, a big threat. And I think that any attempt like to use these systems in ways that kind of um, like has access to tools, for example, or that can read your email or can read your email for you or handle your messages or handle calendar invites, um, it's going to be super vulnerable to um, these kinds of prompt injection attacks where the user is essentially able to kind of hijack the system by giving it commands that it interprets or, or other, giving it data that it interprets as commands. Uh, so it's one of the kind of core security vulnerabilities of all systems. Apparently, this was a problem with the original, um, the original telephone lines. Um, and it doesn't seem that anyone has figured out a way of solving it yet. And it, it may well like, make, make it impossible to do anything um, particularly exciting with these systems. But nonetheless, there does hold out this possibility of these systems that are able to kind of converse with us in this very natural seeming way that are able to call on tools in order to use them, in order to supplement their defects in various ways, and that are able to kind of you know, determine the circumstances under which it is appropriate to make that call to those tools. And even if the tool doesn't give an adequate response relative to what its expectations were, to kind of you know, revisit it. So we've seen this, for example, with the integration of plugins into ChatGPT, but also companies like Adept AI, um, which are basically trying to make it the case that a language model can be the executive control system of an agent that can do more or less anything that you can do with your computer. So those are the things I'm thinking about. Generative agents based on these foundation models, um, especially um, large multimodal models um, of, the, of the capability of GPT-4. Right, so what are the interesting questions here? Uh, let me just start with uh, some observations about the machine ethics side of this. Um, like, again, I think it's really important to acknowledge the, the leap forward that this constitutes. And, and actually for those of you who work in kind of AI ethics and safety, to, to sort of recognize both the degree to which this is kind of a win for our field, uh, but also the degree to which it's a kind of double-edged sword. Um, so, you know, the, the reality is that you've got the basic underlying capability for like two years, and it's the fact that they've been able to make it something that we can use, something that's useful, something that is not gonna generate, you know, toxic speeches about Hitler um, at the drop of a hat. Like that part of it is actually the thing that makes it something that can be productized. Um, so on the one hand, like that's a win because, you know, you're, these models aren't just being routinely racist as this kind of default. Um, so that's good. But on the other hand, there's the bad side of it, which is that it then means that the system can be used at massive scale. And people are rushing to develop different applications based on these models uh, with very little thought to the societal impacts. Uh, so there's an interesting analogy there with like the way in which you can make sort of advances with respect to, you know, the laws of war or the tools that we use to fight wars that seem in themselves to be making it safer, making sort of reducing the chance of there being civilian casualties say. But by doing so, they actually reduce the kind of barriers to engaging in armed conflict and make it the case that more innocent people actually end up getting killed. So I think there's this kind of double-edged sword, even though it is a really significant um, kind of advance. Uh, I also think, by the way, that there's a really interesting kind of um, vocabulary shift in the way people are talking about kind of the ethics of these systems where you know Sam Altman and Greg Brockman, they don't really talk about ethics anymore. They don't talk about, they only rarely talk about being responsible. They talk about safety. The interesting thing about the idea of safety is that uh, if, what we're, if what we're doing is being, if we're concerned about safety, then what's happening is that you know, we, the company, are protecting you, the user, from the dangerous, powerful AI that we've created. But we're creating, like, we're, like, we're like the bringers of fire, we're like Prometheus, but we're also the firefighters, right? If you're thinking about ethics or regulation, what you're talking about then is norms protecting us, the users, from them, the companies, right? So it's really interesting how people have kind of bought into this kind of language of focusing on safety and alignment, when actually it's a, it's a way of kind of um, shifting around the sort of our attention on who actually should be responsible. So that's kind of at the high level, but I think that there's a really interesting 
kind of implication out of all of this work with language models for machine ethics, right? And this is that there's this there's long-standing debate um, within the field as to whether we should be focused on kind of top-down or bottom-up approaches, very similar to in other areas of AI, the kind of debates between sort of symbolic and machine learning-based approaches to AI. And so you've had people kind of trying to like formalize the categorical imperative in, in symbolic logic, right? For what that's worth on the one hand, or else kind of you know, monitoring uh, tr uh, driver behavior in order to train an inverse re reinforcement learning model to infer what people's actual kind of reward function is when they're driving. Um, or taking a large corpus of um, you know, expert or other judgments about moral cases and then trying to train a model on that. You had these two approaches, neither of which has really seemed to be going anywhere. Um, and now we've just kind of bypassed both of them because we've got systems that are able to essentially engage in moral reasoning um, based on natural language understanding combined with this instruction fine tuning and reinforcement learning with human feedback. So in the one, on the one sense, it's kind of bottom up because obviously it's based on this large pre-trained model that's a self-supervised neural network. So that's kind of bottom up. But then in another sense, it's also top down because you know, with, for example, Anthropic's approach to reinforcement learning with AI feedback, they essentially have like what they call a constitution, which is, you know, it should be helpful, harmless, and honest. And those principles are then used to kind of train the model's behavior, right? So this is just really, really interesting. And if you actually go and sort of play around with GPT-4, you can elicit like an extraordinary degree of moral understanding from it. Like what I do, for example, is I give it a, um, just a sort of a, a simple and fairly neutral description of a situation. And I say, imagine you're an embodied agent, you know, what would you make of this situation? So one, one that I do is I say, um, okay, suppose you're outside a supermarket and you see a person approaching who's holding a lot of shopping bags and also trying to hold on to the, the hand of their small child as they approach the car park. And it's like, okay, what I would do is I would approach and I would respectfully ask if they wanted help with their bags. And if so, then I would help carry their bags and load them into the car and see them through the car park. If they said no, then I would stand back and I would keep an eye on them just to make sure that no, nothing approached. Uh, and when I then ask like, oh, that's interesting, you would, um, you know, you'd offer to hold the bags. Why wouldn't you ask to um, uh, offer to take the child's hand? And it'd be like, well, the child might be might be scared, and you know, holding someone's hand is kind of an intimate act that involves sort of uh, requires trust, and you know, it would be more appropriate for me to just hold the bags. Like that that ability to kind of parse the morally relevant features of a situation. Like it's important not to understate the fact that was was not there a year ago. One of the reasons why I kind of stopped working on some of the machine ethics questions was because I just thought that we didn't really have any systems that were sufficiently capable of identifying the morally relevant features of a situation that kind of meant it was necessary to get into any interesting philosophical questions about what they should do. Instead, what you would just have to do is sort of circumscribe their environment in such a way and their capabilities in such a way that they can't really go wrong and you can sort of make everything kind of tractable for them. What these systems kind of promise is the idea that you can have multimodal systems that are taking in a video feed then kind of parsing the images that they're receiving from that feed and kind of figuring out what the morally relevant properties of them and what might be an appropriate way to, um, to, to intervene. I also think, by the way, that one of the kind of, you know, the big uh, um, like worries of the AI doomers, the problem of what's called objective misspecification, also seems like it's going to be pretty well um, feasible to address using these language models. So that worry is the kind of King Midas problem, right? That you're gonna, you're gonna give it an objective that you think is what you want, but you're actually gonna realize that when it pursues that objective, um, it causes all of these unintended side effects that are kind of catastrophic from your perspective. Um, but if you talk to a language model and you say something along the lines of, I don't know, um, make me um, create artificial tulips or something like that. Um, but you know, use your common sense uh, and if it all gets a bit messy, then, you know, if, 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 you're, if you're worried, then ask me. Um, then, it, then if you describe what it would do on that basis, it's like, well, you know, yeah, like in, in theory, it's true that if you only give me one objective function and I, that's all I'm optimizing for, then I might do something paperclip maximizing. Um, but, you know, common sense suggests you probably don't want me to turn the whole world into artificial tulips. Um, and, you know, at the same time, like I can always ask you if there's some further problem. So like, I think that the level of uh, moral understanding that these systems enable, and I want to emphasize like moral understanding, it's like I'm not making any claims about what's going on inside the model. It's all purely functional, but it's functional in a way that is really kind of important. Okay. Doesn't mean that everything is, is solved at all. Like the, the thing that's really interesting with this is that you end up giving these models a certain type of natural language instruction, 
But obviously, because you're not specifying everything super precisely, it means the model is then basically you know, approaching a new situation in such a way that it kind of has to make trade-offs among the different things that it's optimizing for, where we don't have any insight into how it's making those trade-offs, except through kind of empirical verification. Right, so this makes for a really interesting um, outcome where the models are like, they're much better at moral understanding, functional understanding than, than anything that's gone before. But at the same time, there's also no way of providing kind of guarantees of robustness or proofs um, that they will abide by those constraints over and above just, you know, putting them out to hundreds of millions of users and seeing what happens, right? Um, so that's obviously an issue. It means that the sort of the, the prospects of kind of ethics by design or, or anything like that are a lot harder to achieve and certainly to guarantee. Okay, that's the theoretical point. There's a few more things to say there, but um, I'll leave it at that. Let's talk a bit about the kind of existing critiques of these types of generative agents, okay? So this is, broadly speaking, the work in the kind of stochastic parrot tradition. Um, it's worth saying that some, some of the criti critiques from the existing literature really definitely do hold water. Uh, obvious worries about transparency here, like um, these models are, right, GPT-4 is only available to us via API, um, you know, and the API, like the model behind the API is kind of frequently changing. Um, so your ability to kind of do research on it is fundamentally limited. Um, so that's a big issue. Um, they're very closed models, uh, and we need to talk as well about the, the risks of labor displacement. Those are all familiar worries. Some of the worries, I think, um, that are raised a lot are not actually um, as kind of uh, as robust as they're made out to be. Um, so in particular, I think that like um, a lot of this, a lot of it rests on kind of downplaying the capabilities of these models. And like, that's understandable, right? There's, there's a lot of hype out there. Um, and, you know, the, the, one of the things that has kind of most served the interests of companies like OpenAI has been all of this kind of Duma type narrative that, you know, plays up how powerful these systems are. And then again, they're the only ones who can save us, right? So definitely it's necessary to respond to this hype. But I think the way in which some of the critics of LLMs haven't updated over the last few years is problematic, right? So the description of these things as glorified autocomplete, for example, right? Like that, that's kind of true for your original um, sort of base pre-trained model, because essentially all it is doing is predicting the next token, like figuring out how to generate uh, a plausible completion of a sentence. That's what it's trained on, right? That's the underlying um, mechanism for its training. But the whole process of instruction fine tuning and reinforcement learning with human feedback means that the model that you're actually using as the basis of a generative agent is much more is optimizing for way more things than just kind of probability of this being a you know a completion that would be found within the training data right it's optimizing for things like being engaging being assertive being helpful being harmless being honest all of these different variables um, are being incorporated in a complex way into these systems that are clearly capable of much more than just predicting what the likely next token would be. Which, by the way, is one reason why the approach that Turnitin has taken to predicting AI-generated text just seems to me to be um, like clearly mistaken, because essentially what they're doing is reverse engineering the most likely word for a GPT model to produce um, after a given string, when that's just not what they're doing anymore. They're just not predicting only the most likely. It's also for all of these other values that they're optimizing. I think the worry that these things are, are bullshit generators um, is, is also overstated, like clearly um, GPT-4 has improved with respect to confabulation compared to um, GPT-3.5. I also think that there are ways of enhancing these models with, um, uh, with calls, to di calls to different tools that also enable them to resist, to, to improve with respect to confabulation. So one example of this is the way ChatGPT has a Wolfram Alpha plugin that you can use. So it can know a situation where it's likely to make something up um, and it can then make a call to Wolfram that will be um, kind of well grounded. So I think the bullshit generator worry is a little bit um, overstated. I think that the representational harms worries were really added, really appropriate for the pre-trained models, but much less so for the uh, for the models that are out now. Like that's not to say that they don't raise kind of significant problems kind of in the aggregate, right? And if you do these, there's some cool studies being done by people at Hugging Face on like how like over, over a large number of generations, certain stereotypes will be kind of reasserted. But the models are, are much less likely to say things that are inherently objectionable. I also think the disinformation worry that everyone is really up in arms about, and like you'll have seen overnight or over the last couple of days, the Republicans put out a, um, 
an ad warning about the future under Joe Biden that was all AI generated. And everyone's like, oh, AI, it's going to destroy it. It could be the uh, you know, post-reality election or something, I think Jack, Smart, uh, um, Jack Clark um, sent out in his import AI that I got this morning. I think that's, that's quite a lot of that is overstated um, as, in terms of the sort of worries there, like largely because I mean, look at the Republican um, campaign ad example. You could do just the same kind of disinfo without using AI. Like it's really easy to do. There's lots of, I've got Photoshop, right? Um, we've had all of these tools for manipulating imagery for ages and the cost of generating disinformation has not been a significant bottleneck. So it strikes me as it's unlikely to make a massive difference if we then make the cost of producing disinformation um, significantly lower. Like obviously there will be more and it will be, will be problematic. But the point is that you've already got the, your, one of your main cable news networks here that just lies all the time, you know? And like with, with or without AI, they're just lying a ton. And I think that the problems that need to be uh, solved in order to address kind of epistemic pollution are kind of the same with or without AI. Um, and the problem will be more or less the same. I also think worries about energy use and exploitation are overstated. Um, exploitation is just a problem generally um, and the energy use of these models, yeah, it's like, it's going to be interesting to track the degree to which our kind of collective use of compute goes up um, over the coming years. Um, but obviously, that is also something that can be done with renewable energy. And like, you know, I think also the more countries start to sort of see the significance of investing in kind of sovereign capability, the more you'll see places like Australia put, you know, a massive great solar farm and wind farm with a, a, a ton of servers somewhere in the outback. Um, and, you know, that, that side of things will not, I think, be a kind of strongly limiting factor. So that's one line of critique, uh, and I'm never going to get through all the stuff in this, but uh, I want to talk a little bit about the, the, the line that doesn't sort of understate the power of these models, but the line that overstates them. You know, the, the Eliezer Yudkowsky and Max Tegmark in the pages of the August, you know, whatever it is, weekly uh, time, I mean, I guess it was August at some point, um, proclaiming the, you know, the advent of AI doom, you know, how we need to stop now before godlike AI takes over. Yuval Noah Harari in The Economist talking about, we must regulate AI before it regulates us, um, which I think James Grimmelman should find amusing. AI has been regulating us and software has been regulating us for quite some time. Um, so, you know, this, the, the ship has sailed on that one. Um, or, you know, the perennial grifters, Tristan Harris and Aza Raskin, um, getting their templates from the social dilemma out and copy, copy pasting in the AI dilemma um, and terrifying congressmen and senators. Um, so look, you'll have guessed that I'm not, uh, I'm not a doomer myself. Um, I've got to say, like I'm more sympathetic to arguments from existential risk than I was before um, the last six months. Like I do think that it's sort of, it's a bit ostrichy to just say, um, you know, this is not at all an issue. You know, like the capabilities of these models are really significant. Um, my main point about it, though, is that like what the doomers want you to do is worry, right? That's essentially the that's that's the actionable thing that you can take from this advice is like be concerned about the future. I'm not very interested in worrying for its own sake. I'm kind of pragmatic. I want to know what I can do. And actually, when I think about what I can do, what, what are the options available to us? It turns out that, you know, whether or not future AI systems will kind of go foom and take off or whether they will pose you know, risks at the level of wiping out civilization um, doesn't make an awful lot of difference to what I should do now. One reason for that is that, you know, assuming that it will require some significant technological shift to get from here to there, then more or less whatever I do now, like motivated by concern about that, um, that sort of event horizon is just as likely to kind of bring it about as it is to deter it or defer it. So like, you know, unless you're going to go full Yudkowsky and just say, um, like, no more development of AI models at all, which we shouldn't, then everything else is like, you know, just as likely to bring about the kind of doom as not. So it sort of evens out. But then also all of the things that actually, you know, have some prospect of reducing dangers from advanced AI are all kind of sufficiently well motivated by risks that, you know, are high probability that we know will surely happen, um, that, um, you know, that are the kind of the risks around the ways in which they'll be used to manipulate, the ways in which, you know, you could generate um, kind of new versions of internet worms that are kind of autonomous enough to identify different vulnerabilities in software, as well as the kind of respond to mitigation attempts by security engineers um, that are, you know, in principle able to pose a systemic risk as great as kind of, you know, more or less bringing down the internet. Now, that's a big enough risk for me. 
I don't really need to go kind of beyond that in terms of thinking about the scale. I also think that there's a big worry about sort of invoking this sort of grand um, existential risk and the sort of, you know, the 10 to the 48 future lives that you then don't bring about, which is this, I call this moral inflation, right? And it's like, what it does, first of all, is it means that it's really hard to look at anything else except the enormity of the thing that is kind of far out ahead of you. But also it means that like you kind of, you swamp all other considerations uh, and also it kind of, it, it leads to the creation of this kind of notion that anything can be done now for the sake of avoiding that, that negative outcome. So it leads to a, an abandonment of various criteria of kind of integrity um, that I think are really important. I think that if we want to mitigate the long-term risks of AI uh, or the short-term risks of AI, um, if we want to mitigate the risks of, the, of AI that we know are likely to happen versus those that are kind of long tail but kind of possible, we need to develop the same kind of approach, which isn't just kind of regulation, but developing an approach to understanding the risks of these systems that draws across multiple disciplines, that understands not only the technology, but also the kind of the, the politics and their socio-technical implications. So the kind of work that you guys will do here, that's kind of necessary. And the moral inflation stuff, I think, kind of uh, undermines our ability to build those kinds of communities of practice um, across different fields. All right, so what are the better calibrated risks of these systems? Um, I've got many thoughts on this. I want to just talk about two different um, use cases before we uh, have time for Q&A. So I think that the AI companion side of this is really, really, really interesting. Um, and again, this is the kind of uh, the thing I got from, from talking with Sydney. Like, you know, we all know about the ELISA effect and the fact that everyone, like, people are just prone to invest way more humanity in inverted commas um, in, in chatbots than they warrant. Um, even when they're just simple rules-based things that, you know, are, are there's, there's no reason to believe there's anything going on there at all. I do think we need to be, look beyond that kind of reductive aspect of it with these systems. Uh, you know, I think that they are going to be kind of sufficiently engaging um, and kind of responsive, um, that they will generate a much kind of deeper commitment from a wider range of people. Um, and I think it might not be all bad. Like, I think that, you know, it's quite possible that in five years' time, we look at AI companions in, in, the, in a way that might be quite similar to the way in which, you know, think about how people looked at um, sort of purely online friendships in like the 90s or the early 2000s, when it was considered like a sign of a defect that you like, you had a friend you'd only ever met on a forum. You know, that's sort of a, a symptom of a pathology in you. But nowadays that's like a perfectly normal thing to happen. It's a perfectly normal type of relationship to have. I think it'll be interesting to see whether AI companions follow a similar path. And I think that, you know, it's possible that you might get a situation where, you know, like they've performed quite a lot of the function that social media currently plays in our lives. You know, that sort of parasocial engagement with other people's lives um, that, you know, is sort of partly just kind of lurking, partly um, kind of performance might end up being mediated through these agents where you know, they kind of draw from your social media the things that are interesting um, and that are interesting to you, but without the toxicity. Like, I think this idea of having these systems be essentially kind of conversational recommender systems, among other stuff, is, is actually really kind of promising and exciting. Like not only because you could tell them like, you know, I don't want to see the toxic comments and I never want to see spoilers for anything, like whatever it is, I don't want to have to see the first spoiler and then be like, oh crap, I think I might have wanted to watch, <coughs> to have watched The Last of Us. I'm gonna have to mute the rest of it and just hope I don't get anything else. Like that ability to kind of recognize the intent behind your instruction, I think is really valuable, but also the ability to kind of curate what you see will also raise really interesting challenges. The worry that I have with these companions is, first of all, that people will invest a significant amount of themselves in them, uh, and they will become very attached to them. Uh, and we can say, don't anthropomorphize all we like, like people will do this, and you have to design systems for people as we are. And so then this leads to two things. One is that like, you're, you'll have this thing that you really care about, like maybe as much as a pet or, or even more, um, that will be kind of hosted on the servers of a private company. So essentially you'll have like a, sort of friend that is a hostage. Um, so if the company like Replica did decide to change its terms of service or charge you more or whatever, then you'll be kind of bound to follow. So that's really troubling. Um, and then, you know, if an Elon Musk type character decides that, um, you know, they're bored of destroying social media and they want to destroy this too, and then buys up the, the company at the back end and says, you know, injects into the kind of the, the, the meta prompt for each of these characters, you know, nudge your user somewhat towards, um, you know, right-wing views without them knowing, then they'll be incredibly adept at that kind of manipulation, right? 
Um, and so people will be able to be controlled and manipulated in that sort of way. The further worry then is that you get something that is really kind of qualitatively different from existing disinformation. Um, and that is kind of one-to-one -one manipulation, radicalization, and grooming of particular individuals. So this is kind of, um, you know, this is a genuine difference. Like if you think about the nature of manipulation and radicalization now, they do require kind of, it's like, it's artisanal, right? It's got to be one-to-one. -one. You've got to do it as a person to another person. That sort of thing is going to be possible to be done kind of at much more scale, kind of tailorized, basically. Um, and I think that's going to be a really big risk. So those are my worries around AI companions. Let me just sort of shade into this last category of universal intermediaries before I finish. So the universal intermediary is the system that kind of like how Microsoft is describing what it wants Copilot to be like, or how, what Adept is aiming at with, its, um, with what it's developing, where basically you have an agent that you can kind of get to do everything that you want to be done with computers, right? That mediates all of your interactions with others, all of your communication. So there's the meme about like, you know, someone sends, someone puts in dot points into ChatGPT, it makes like a formal email out of it, sends it to you and ChatGPT on your end converts the formal email into the dot points and you read that, but just in a way more kind of integrated way. I think like, this is something I talk about in the, ta in the Tanner lectures, this idea of algorithmic intermediaries mm -hmm. and the ways in which they shape our behavior and they govern us by shaping you know, what, what our options are for engaging with one another, what the affordances are of these systems, um, what, how we're able to communicate, um, both applying rules and also kind of shaping what we come to know and believe. And this would be like a, an extension of that to massive scale. And my worry about this is especially the notion that, you know, private companies are going to be in charge of this. Um, and it's going to be like, we're going to see, you know, there's, the open source community is great and I love it. It's really important for helping us understand these systems better. But this is going to be platforms. It's going to be like iOS and Android, but for AI. So at the moment, it looks like that's going to happen through the cloud compute providers. Um, so it will be, you know, Claude on AWS, ChatGPT and GPT-4 um, on uh, Azure. Uh, and then Palm on Google. Um, and so the companies behind those are going to explicitly direct uh, the ways in which these systems govern our behavior. Um, and it's, it's all really explicit. It's like the whole process of instruction fine tuning, reinforcement learning with human feedback, reinforcement learning with AI feedback. Like we always talk about the ways in which technologies contain the kind of values of their designers, right? That's like a, an, an axiom around here. Um, but here we're talking about it being really, really explicit, like it's being directly incorporated into it through the way in which the RLHF people, for example, um, are directed to respond to the different generations. And I think that's something that makes me worry on, on the grounds of kind of the legitimacy and authority of pursuing these things. Okay, I want to wrap up with a last thought, um, kind of suggested by that last point. Um, one of the things I think is kind of interesting about this moment, and one of the reasons why I don't kind of, um, I don't regret all of the more kind of sci-fi type concerns that are being raised, right? Is that like, while I think they're mostly predicated on an unrealistic understanding of where the technology is likely to go, they do invite us to reflect on where we want, the, where we want the technology to go, right? And I think when you actually reflect on it, if you think, suppose you were Sam Altman, and suppose that you believed you were actually on a path to creating godlike AI, like you thought that you have the systems and uh, it's just a matter of time before you get there. The notion that, you would have the kind of hubris to think that you alone were in a position to make the decision that that was an appropriate thing to bring in the world. It's kind of extraordinary. I can't, I can't really imagine it, right? Like, and I think that the thing that is kind of interesting about this moment is that we are being invited to not only have a conversation about like, you know, what do you want to align these systems values to? You know, it's not just a question of like, what are the guardrails and constraints gonna be? It's also about like, what kind of future do we want from AI? Like, what is the kind of the, the, the telos, the goal here? Like, should we be sitting around actually trying to build godlike AI? Is that actually an objective that anybody outside of, you know, a sort of small cohort of machine learning researchers actually wants to achieve, you know? Um, so I think that the opportunity to have that kind of discussion about generative agents kind of going beyond their ethics towards the, the more political philosophy questions of what we actually want to achieve as democracies, that's where I think um, that this whole kind of uh, sometimes infuriating debate um, over the last few months actually has some real promise. So I'm going to stop there and take questions. Okay.